The purpose of this video is to provide general information and education about the care of a critically ill child. It is in no way a substitute for the independent decision making and judgment by a qualified health care professional. The information contained in this video should not be used to make a diagnosis or to overrule the advice of a qualified health care provider, nor should it be used to provide advice for emergency medical treatment. Initial Trauma Evaluation by Dr. David Mooney Please note that in this video we will be following the guidelines used at Boston Children's Hospital. Some of this information may need to be modified based on the equipment, guidelines, and practices in place in your institution. I'm David Mooney. I'm the Director of Trauma at Children's Hospital Boston. And what I want to talk today about is uh, how to do a pediatric trauma resuscitation. Preparation. Um, pediatric trauma resuscitation is one of the exciting things we have to do. Uh, there's a lot of action, everyone's nervous. Uh, but the first thing that you need to do for a pediatric trauma resuscitation is the really boring part, um, the preparing for it. Uh, it's very important what you do in advance well before the patient arrives so that you're ready when that happens. Um, the, there are three things that you need to think about when you're thinking about how to do a pediatric trauma resuscitation. The first of which is people, who's going to be there. The second is equipment. And then the third thing is what kids are you going to keep versus what kids you're going to transfer. So let's talk about people. In order to do a resuscitation, it doesn't matter what someone's rank is. It doesn't matter if they're a surgeon or emergency physician or nurse or respiratory therapist. Uh, what matters is that they have the skills available to do that job. Uh, the first of which is the airway. Airway management is the most important role in the resuscitation. The lives that are saved in the ED and the lives that are saved pre-hospital are typically because someone has, has acquired and secured the airway and maintained it. Uh, up to one-third of brain injury deaths that happen in pediatric trauma patients is because of loss or lack of an airway. So maintaining, securing and maintaining the airway is a, is a remarkably valuable skill. And the person with the best airway skills should be the person who gets assigned to that job. So step one, who's going to do the airway? Um, another skill that's necessary is the evaluator. I'm right-handed, so typically I would evaluate the patient from the right side. Someone's got to examine the patient, call out the findings to the team, and uh, just walk down head to toe, and we'll talk about the primary and secondary survey. The third is uh, starting IVs, interacting the patient up to the monitors. Um, someone's got to uh, draw labs, do those other sort of duties that happen during the resuscitation. And then finally, who's in charge? It's important to maintain someone with a 30,000 foot view so that they can sort of see the big picture, what's going on, how is the overall resuscitation going. If they're caught up in having trouble starting an IV, they're not going to be able to think about the airway or the medications that need to be used or the consultant that needs to be called. So someone's got to stand at the back, not involved with procedures, and run the show. So those are really the four main roles. And again, it doesn't matter what someone, the letters someone has after their name. What matters is their, their um, skill set. What matters is how qualified are they to perform those roles. Number two is equipment. One of the hassles with pediatric uh, resuscitation is the varied sizes of equipment that children have, especially compared to adults. Um, it's hard to remember the sizes of equipment, and that's why many of us carry pocket cards that tell us per kilo or per age the right size equipment for a child. Uh, another guide can be length-based systems, measuring the length of the child, and then having your equipment organized. Since the airway is so important, it's important that the airway equipment be readily achievable directly behind the person who's in charge of the airway. They have to stay there and get the equipment they need. There are a few basic things. Oxygen, a mask, a bag valve mask. It can be a non-rebreather or a anesthesia bag, but oxygen with a mask, airways, oral and nasal airways, a suction, and then sort of intubation equipment. That stuff needs to be available readily for all patients. 
The other equipment sort of generally available for patients, for all patients, is IV catheters, cervical collars in case they come and not wearing one, and then you get into contingency equipment, um, maybe a chest tube or a needle for a pneumothorax. Uh, some patients, but most won't need a chest tray, cricothyroidotomy tray, some of those sort of specialized things, uh, skeletal traction that you use every once in a while. You need to know where those things are, uh, but they don't need to be right next to the patient. They need to be readily available and labeled for that unusual situation where you need them. But again, those are second tier things, rarely used, but when you do need them, you need to be able to get to them right away. And then the third thing, um, who's gonna stay at your hospital versus who's gonna be transferred? In patients who are transferred, how are they transferred? Ground or air? Um, some hospitals have excellent pediatric orthopedic capabilities, but not great pediatric neurosurgical capabilities, or maybe, or vice versa. And it's best if that can be established in advance by policy, um, but if it can't be established by policy, the person who's in the ED performing, leading the resuscitation needs to know the capabilities of the hospital that day. If there's one neurosurgeon comfortable with pediatric neurosurgical care and that person's on vacation, the ED person needs to know that, so they need to know what to do with the child who comes in who needs that person's expertise. Communication. Um, then let's talk a little bit about the general behavior in a trauma room. Um, people that watch television and watch some shows like ER think people yell and scream and carry on. Those are really all, uh, behavior like that is really detrimental to the care of the patient. The trauma room needs to be a very controlled environment. It doesn't need to be quiet, it needs to be controlled. The first thing that happens is, uh, that helps control the environment is that the event manager or team leader needs to take charge. All communications go through that person. Um, and again, that could be a surgeon, emergency physician, uh, nursing personnel. That person who's running the resuscitation, communications go through them. Um, this, the other thing that needs to happen to help out with the resuscitation in terms of general behavior is called closed loop communication. What that means is no one calls to the air, we need an IV. They call to the person next to them, Mary or Bill, could you start an IV in the left, left arm? And Mary or Bill would say, yes, I'll start an IV. The loop has been closed, the communication goes to a person, not up in the air, and then you have much more confidence that that actually is gonna be done, rather than people just calling to the wind what they think needs to happen next. Primary survey. Trauma resuscitation is very prone to rote behavior. It's easy to standardize the behavior and standardize the evaluation. And one of those things that has been very standardized, been very successful, is the concept of ABCs, airway breathing circulation. The reason why ABCs work out very well, because when someone comes down and when an injured patient comes into the ED, someone comes down to resuscitate them, everybody's nervous. In the critically injured children, uh, most hospitals see one or two or at most a dozen critically injured kids in a, in a calendar year, ABC. It's very easy to remember, and what's nice, it's in the order that someone's gonna die if they don't have them. A for airway. If someone doesn't have an airway, five to 10 minutes, progressive anoxia, they'll suffer brain damage or die. If they have an airway but they're not breathing, you've got 30 to 40 minutes of CO2 accumulation and then they'll die from the acidosis. Children tend to tolerate um, blood loss very well. They constrict peripherally very nicely and um, they can tolerate uh, much more blood loss than adults can, and also show signs of blood loss later than adults normally do. So A, B, C, remember those and start down the patient. So for the typical patient, the A, B, C takes 30 seconds. Um, the evaluator does the exam, calls out the findings to the team so everyone can hear what they're finding. Is the patient crying? Is it, if they have normal cry, normal voice, Fortunately, most children have a normal airway. Second, are they breathing? Chest rise, uh, equal chest rise, listen to breath sounds. If they have equal breath sounds on the chest, breathing is done. If in a child, you wanna feel a brachial pulse or a femoral pulse. Radial pulse sometimes takes a little higher pressure than a, a young child will have. Carotid pulse is unreliable. So brachial femoral pulses, done. That's the ABC, the big thing is done. If 
going down the ABCs, you find there's an airway issue, stop and address that before moving onward. It's nice if you have the airway person can start to work on that while you check out the rest of the body as they're now getting their airway equipment and starting the suction. Secondary survey. ABC is done, again, 30 seconds, findings called out. Then a secondary survey, and specifically the trauma resuscitation, start at the top of the head, go to the foot. So the first thing that I do is I feel the head. Uh, start at the top of the head, feel for any hematomas, any lacerations. It's important to feel around the head because it's, it's not unusual for laceration to be hidden by hair and, uh, and also, or to be, um, feel smaller than it seems because it's been covered with some uh, hair that's been matted with blood. Uh, feel around the scalp, feel for any bumps, any fractures, especially any depressed fractures or soft spots around the back of the head and then inspect for any battle sign behind the ear or any raccoon eyes, which could indicate a basal or skull fracture. Raccoon eyes are, uh, tend to be delayed a day or two after trauma, but it's possible that they're present at first. Then I feel along the supraorbital rims and then along the maxilla, come along the zygomatic arches and just feel to make sure that they're stable. Then I come along the edge of the mandible and you can sneak under the collar to do that and just feel for any stability or instability in the mandible and up along the condyles of the mandible to the TMJs. Then what I'll do is I'll look in the patient's ear, just one ear than the other, looking for blood behind the tympanic membranes or any fluid coming out of the ear, which could mean a spinal fluid leak. Look up the nose, make sure the septum's in place and there's no hematoma, similarly looking for spinal fluid, and then come along their teeth. And uh, I don't put my finger in people's mouth, but I will push on their teeth with a Q-tip, I push along and look for any loose teeth, any lacerations on their tongue. If they're cooperative, I have them lift their tongue up and stick their tongue out. And then I'll feel their mid-face, their nose and their mid-face to look for excessive movement, as you would find with a bad Lefort fracture. And then head and face are done. While someone is, secure, is holding the head stable, loosen the front of their collar. In a cooperative patient, you ask them to cooperate and not move their head. Um, if they're frantic, hold on the neck for a second until they settle down. Or you can feel under their collar. It's possible to feel under their collar for any, in the gap in the front for any crepitus, any expanding hematomas. Don't try to clear the neck initially. Feel the neck, feel for any pain, feel for any tenderness, um, crepitus, hematomas, put the collar back on. The initial resuscitation is a bad time to try and just clear the neck. Once you felt the neck, literally move down the body, feel the chest, listen to the breath sounds again, listen to the heart sounds, and look for any signs of trauma on the neck. Crepitus on the chest of, an, of a trauma patient is a pneumothorax until determined otherwise. Crepitus in the neck of a trauma patient is either pneumothorax or torn larynx until determined otherwise. It could be something else, but you need to worry that it's a pneumothorax. And then walk down the body. It, Palpate the abdomen, any bruises, any contusions, any tenderness. Feel that if the pelvis is stable, try and rock the pelvis. Then walk down the extremities. Move, move the shoulder, move the elbow, move the wrist. Feel the pulses. Have the patient, if they're cooperative, have them wiggle their fingers and squeeze your hands. Similar on the other arm. And then walk down the legs. Bend the hips, bend the knees, bend the ankles. Feel the pulses. Have the patient their cooperative wiggle their toes, step down on the gas, pull up to the ceiling, and lift their thigh, drop down, lift their thigh, drop down. Then in concert with the team, when that's been done, with someone stabilizing the head and neck, another person on the body, the patient as a log is rolled to the side, palpation down the spine, rectal exam. We may one day do away with the rectal exam in kids, but we're still doing it. You're looking for gross blood, you're looking for the position of the prostate, and do they have good rectal tone or not. That secondary survey takes five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, if, if, it's, if it goes slow. Checkpoint. And now it's time to take a pause. You've gathered some information, the patient's on some monitors, you've got some data to work on. Now we do what we call a checkpoint. And this is based on, a, um, we've modified a project that's been undertaken by the World Health Organization on trying to devise a trauma checkpoint. 
the idea is everyone in the room stops um, and they pay attention to the team leader or event manager, the person running the show. And that person just recaps the highlights. What happened to the child? Here's the story. The child was fell off their bike, hit by a car. What happened to them before they arrived? They're at another hospital. This happened there. They underwent these studies there. Stable or not on the way, and here they are. Their vital signs, including their oxygen saturation, are noted. Uh, the Glasgow Coma Score, then down the body, injuries that have been found. We want to walk down brain, face, neck, chest, abdomen, extremities. You mentioned any neurologic findings any related to disability to make sure we're finishing that off. And we want to mention their temperature. We pause, we go over whatever information we found, and then we decide the plan. So here's John, he was hit uh, by a car on his bike. Uh, he was brought into an outside hospital. They did a CAT scan of his head, which is normal, um, uh, but we're concerned about his abdomen. He hasn't had any imaging of his belly yet. So um, Johnny comes in, his GCS is 15. He's his vital signs are stable. His oxygen saturation is 100 on two liters nasal cannula. So far for injuries, we've identified that uh, he has some mild tenderness on the back of his neck um, and uh, some tenderness in his left upper quadrant. Um, his head is otherwise fine, his, his uh, neck we just discussed. His chest is okay with good breath sounds. We're concerned about his belly, his pelvis feels stable, and his extremities uh, are atraumatic except for an abrasion on his left arm. So what we're gonna do from here, we're going to uh, get a CAT scan of his abdomen. Uh, we're gonna draw our lab test, we're gonna draw a CBC, check a urinalysis, and a hold the chemistry tube for later, in addition to a typing screen in case he has a liver injury. And we're going to have the uh, neurosurgeon see him because we're a bit concerned about his head despite the CAT scan. And we'll get a lateral neck, a neck x-ray. Could you please get a temperature on Johnny before we uh, go, to, go to CT? And, um, and then if anyone in the room has a problem or they've identified something, maybe they noticed something on the monitor the team leader didn't notice, that's the time that they bring it up. And uh, that's the, the whole point for the checkpoint, to make sure that nothing's been missed, the whole team chimes in, They've all fulfilled the roles. Okay, everyone knows the plan. Now let's move on. And uh, just taking that one moment to pause, that takes maybe 60 to 90 seconds, saves a lot of time and confusion later on in terms of who, what consultants are needed, what do we need to scan, et cetera. Parent presence. Um, here in the States, parental presence uh, has become expected. Uh, we have the patients, in the patients' parents in the room for a variety of different reasons. Number one, it's their child, and they want to see their child, and their child oftentimes wants to see them. Um, as soon as the dust starts to settle, we put the parent by the child's head. I find that is better than Versed at calming the child down. And just knowing that their parent is next to them, they feel a lot more relaxed. We get a much better exam, much more reliable in things like clearing the neck when the child settled down especially for younger children, we get the parent as quickly as we can by the child's head. The second reason for having the parent present is actually for the parent. Being off in a side room where you can sort of hear what's going on but you can't see it or getting a sense of sort of people going by you and heading into the trauma room is very disconcerting for the parents. Uh, one thing that we've just come to realize is up to a third of kids that get admitted to a hospital for an injury um, come down with post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Um, half of whom go on to develop long-term issues related to post-traumatic stress disorder. We found that that correlates directly with the level of parental anxiety. And whatever we can do to decrease the anxiety level of the parent uh, won't just help the parent, will actually help their child. Because uh, many times those, uh, the stress symptoms are actually worse than the physical symptoms they suffered from the injury. So it's not just that we want the parent to be happy, it's that we don't want the parent to make the child unhappy. So whatever we can do to help them will also help your patient, the child. There may be cultures where parental presence isn't proper, where it just would be unacceptable to have the parent in the room. Or, um, and in some situations, uh, parents may not be behaving properly. They may be very dramatic and disrupt the room. Uh, it's important if they're in the room to have them accompanied. They can't be there by themselves. They need to be with a social worker or with an ED worker, someone with them 
to help explain to them what's going on and to help them understand what their role is in the room. Um, and again, it's very likely there are situations, uh, especially in other cultures, where that may not be the best option for the patient. Uh, here in the States, that works very well. Studies. Let's talk a little bit about labs and x-rays, because that's a, a hot topic lately. The idea about uh, CAT scan radiation in children. A common trend in the world of adult trauma care is the PAN scan. Head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis. Uh, if someone comes in with a moderate risk of injury from the top of their head to the bottom of the pubis right through the scanner, results in beautiful images. You can see a lot of different things that you just really couldn't see before. Um, there are a couple reasons why that's a bad idea for a child. Um, the first of which is the radiation exposure. The radiation risk for CT scanning is real. Uh, there have been several studies now looking at the radiation doses that are applied during a CT scan and the subsequent risk of cancer. Uh, conservatively, if a five-year-old child has a PAN scan, top of the head to the bottom of the pelvis, conservatively their risk for developing cancer is 1 in 125, and their chance of dying of a cancer is 1 in 500. So if the policy in your department is that a kid comes in or the practice in your department is a child comes in, they get run through the scanner, um, there's a real chance that you're giving some kids cancer that's at a much higher risk of dying than the risk of them dying from that event, from that injury. Many of them may not be injured. They may have some bruises and bumps and bumps, and now they've just been given a cancer risk. That's number one, and that's a real risk. As the children get younger, the risk gets higher. Number two is that we don't do anything with much of the data. For example, CAT scan of the chest gives you beautiful images of the chest. The purpose for getting a CAT scan of the chest in a trauma patient isn't to see the lungs, it's to see the mediastinum, to look for a torn aorta. Torn aorta is a rare event in a child. We, children have flexible vessels, their mechanisms are very different from old adults with fragile aortic arches and tough ligamentums arteriosum, which can knuckle and tear. Um, they're very different, it's a rare condition. It would be remarkably rare to have a child come in with a normal chest x-ray and have a torn aorta. So the first step would be to get a chest x-ray with a high, high energy mechanism, big deceleration, and an abnormal x-ray. If you feel in that patient they need a CT of their chest, fine. But not as a screening tool. There's little pneumothoraces and contusions that we see on CAT scan that cannot be seen on a plain film or subclinical. They don't need follow-up films. They, the patients can still go on positive pressure ventilation. They're subclinical events, and there's been very little to no correlation between the, the uh, volume of contused lung and a subsequent clinical course of the child. Um, we do still scan a lot of abdomens. There's a lot of controversy about the use of FAST scan in children because many children with a negative FAST exam, in fact, 30% of kids with a solid organ injury will have a negative FAST exam, and many of those kids with a negative FAST uh, still cannot be ruled out for an organ injury. Uh, hopefully in the coming years that will change. CT scan of the neck is also very controversial. Um, you get beautiful pictures of the bones, but at a high risk of radiation to the thyroid gland. If you just took off the collar in all children who came into the ED with an injury, more than 99% of them would be fine. No injury to their neck. If you then limit it to how you're gonna even get any imaging of the neck, and more than half of the children who come into our emergency department get no imaging of their neck. Um, but if you limit it just to kids with tenderness in their neck or symptoms related to the neck limit, or are unconscious, any imaging and just to those kids, uh, most in our experience, uh, almost all of the injuries will be picked up by plain films and it's very unusual to need further imaging other than to better define an injury that's already been picked up by other means. Cat scanning of the head, there's some great algorithms already in place for uh, when is a CAT scan of the head necessary or not necessary? So about imaging. One of the traditions in trauma care has been to get a stat lateral neck x-ray, chest x-ray, and pelvic x-ray. The purpose for those films are if the patient's in shock. Is their pelvis in two pieces? Do they have a tension pneumothorax or a hemothorax? Or is their neck in two pieces causing spinal shock? If a patient's in shock, sure, get the films. If a patient's not in shock, we only get films based upon our clinical suspicions. We no longer get routine uh, neck, chest, pelvis x-rays. Um, if the 
pelvis is unstable or is tender, we'll get the x-ray. Um, if the neck is tender, if the patient complains of neck pain, then we get the x-ray, otherwise we don't. We do get more chest films because 40% of kids with chest injuries have a normal external exam of their chest, um, but they have to have a good mechanism. They have to be uh, hit by a car or off the bike into the pavement, something where they took a big blow to their chest directly. Um, most of the kids don't need a, neck x or a chest x-ray, uh, but the ones with a good mechanism, we will get that. For lab tests, um, we have uh, carefully reviewed the literature and we've honed our lab test down to a CBC. Uh, we hold a chemistry tube, so in case on some clinical suspicion, uh, we'll run the chemistries as needed. Um, a type in screen and we get a UA looking for blood. We stop doing electrolytes, LFTs, coags, the whole host of other lab tests because on careful review of over 500 patients at our institution, uh, coming through our trauma activation system, we found that they were not helpful. And that just confirms um, many other people's findings in the literature. Conclusion. So uh, what we've gone over is the basics of a pediatric trauma resuscitation. First off, preparing in advance. Who's going to be there and what are their roles? Uh, what equipment are you going to need and how is it organized? So you can get to it easily in that moment of need without a lot of extra thinking. And some sort of nice pocket card so you can pull out your spare brain. Um, and thirdly, um, who's going to stay at your hospital and who's going to be transferred? So start that process early so that you can be resuscitating the patient while the transport team is on their way and not have them sitting waiting for transport when those two things could have been happening simultaneously. We've talked about the primary survey and the secondary survey, some of the cornerstones of, of trauma resuscitation, adult or child, and some of the, the specific things about the pediatric resuscitation. And then finally, we talked about some of the things we've done here uh, with our reviews of literature and our reviews of the data from our own place, what we've done with lab tests and what we do for imaging for children. Uh, we've tried very hard to avoid radiation and to only do the imaging studies that we feel, based on our exams, are necessary. Um, we've gone a little bit away from the knee jerk of some of the things from the past, like the neck, chest, and pelvis, and really have tried to go to more of a cognitive model where we actually examine the patient first, and then based upon our, our findings for the needs, then go on to the imaging studies. And then finally, we, we've tried to talk through this, the whole concept of crisis resource management and having a resuscitation be a controlled environment with a structure and a checkpoint so that everybody on the team provides input, everybody on the team knows the plan, and then it just rolls along. It's much calmer, it's much better for the patient, and we believe uh, provides better results. Uh, thank you very much. That concludes our video on initial trauma evaluation. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video? Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments? You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Note, feedback is not required to complete this activity in the Guided Learning Pathway.